Wow, thank you so much, Paul. I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> Paul and Jacob, uh, both names from the Bible here. But uh, wonderful presentation, it was uh, enlightening. It, it never gets old. I mean, I know Mishashu came through last year to give uh, somewhat similar talks uh, to last year's cohort, but uh, it, it's always nice to have you guys come over. Uh, it's, I've always thought, I mean, it's amazing what people are up to in the country. Uh, we just meet each other at malls without knowing the important work that you do. Uh, but anyways, lots of important questions here. Uh, I, I know people in this 5310 will probably be interested in data preservation. You know, there are privacy issues, records management. Uh, so if there are questions, people, please feel free. Uh, the floor is open. Yeah, so if you have a question, uh, uh, you, you don't have to type in the chat. Uh, I don't think there are a lot of people around you. You can just uh, feel free and ask, and my, uh, unmute and then ask, and then uh, I think Jacob will respond. So I think Zola has a question. Please, Zola. Okay, well, I have two questions, but uh, the first one has to do with the penetration of smart care. I'm just curious as to, because I see, for instance, that you still have like the associates, the data associates that you have to send to the field. So I'm just curious, therefore, that like, how much coverage does smart care have over the, like in the country? Uh, sorry, okay. you can just give you a bit of context. Zola is from a different part of the continent here, is joining us from South Africa. So, I mean, the situation is completely different there. West still is in Cape Town, actually. So just to give you some context <laughs> of what you're asking that question. Yeah, so um, I think on, on the call last week, he was also there, and I think I, I got a, I got a I got introduced to him on the call last week, and I'm aware that he's in Cape Town. Thank you for that question. Um, so SmartCare is in, I would say probably by this time around, in close to 90% of the facilities that are providing ART, okay? So um, to respond to your question about why we, we're still sending um, our data associates to these facilities to, to, to do the work that they're doing, is that um, while SmartCare is present in these facilities, uh, SmartCare is an offline uh, system, okay? What that means is that um, in order for you to collect uh, a data from SmartCare from a particular facility, you have to physically go there and uh, get a copy of that database in an encrypted format and bring it to your location and uh, that's where you'll be able to merge it and uh, look at the data. Uh, having said that, um, it's also important to understand that SmartCare is a very old system, okay? It's pro it was probably designed, this is when 2020, um, it was probably designed maybe around 2000, or in the early 2000s, I should say, mid to, to early to mid 2000s. That's the time that SmartCare was designed, okay? So the design back then was to meet the need at that time, and there hasn't really been a lot of um, drive to bring SmartCare to sort of utilize uh, uh, new technologies in terms of, or current technologies in terms of uh, having a, uh, it connected to a network. However, okay, um, as we are talking, there's been uh, a project running to modernize SmartCare, and it's taken a number of years now. It's probably taken longer than it, sh than it should have, but Going forward, probably in the next two years or so, I, I estimate, uh, SmartCare will become more um, reliant on in, in an attractive environment, uh, just the way we expect all modern technology to run. It's a web-based, it will be a web-based system. So we won't have to worry so much about, or we won't have to think about sending someone to a facility to go and collect uh, data. And also you have to understand that the environment here in Zambia, at the time that SmartCare was being designed, we didn't have very good internet coverage. Okay? It's only now that you have 4G in uh, even rural areas, okay? And so it was designed to work in an offline environment where there's no network, no internet. It's just a facility with a computer and uh, someone to enter data in that uh, computer. Okay, thanks. Um, I like to, so I see there are a couple of questions. I'm not sure if I oh, should ask sorry, the, yes. the second one or should I just like give a chance to choose there because I see he has like, two questions as well. Uh, I suppose you can ask the second question. As, yeah, uh, go ahead and ask Okay. Um, so uh, just a bit of um, an interlude before I get to the question here. I was excited to see the 
the methods you're using for data retention. And mostly because I also work in sort of in a similar area, I pretty much which is natural language generation, like you generate text from data itself. But so, but to get to the question now is, I see that you're saying that there's a problem with um, the fact that patients don't really understand the, they may not know, for instance, the, the treatment they're on. So in other words, they don't have access to their own uh, healthcare records themselves. So I'm just curious, have you ever considered like also using similar techniques, which we're doing with the templates, as also offering an interface that's targeted to the, to the patient? Um, so that's, that's a very good point. So I think we need, something we need to, I need to mention is that as CIDAS, uh, our mandate is to provide, make sure that our patients are on treatment, make sure that we are putting all the uh, patients on, tr on treatment that are supposed to be on treatment under, under this program. When it comes to smart care, our mandate is to deploy smart care make sure that uh, people are trained in the health, health facilities to use smart care. And uh, so in short, in terms of uh, innovation or new ways of uh, presenting data to the patient, while we have uh, the capacity to do it and we can do it, uh, it's not something that's uh, in our, our, our main objectives in terms of our project deliverables. Okay, now I completely understand the benefits of, of having a patient view their own records and they can view their records. The only limitation currently is that they can only view it when the provider opens their record at the health facility. Okay. And so the other, um, the other solution that's there to sort of um, respond to your question is that uh, apart from the care card, patients do receive a paper, it's very small card, which uh, has information about the the next appointment dates. It may not have information about. I don't recall if it has information about the uh, drugs. I don't think so. It just has information about the the um, the, the appointment dates and the like. But I think that's a good point, and it's probably something that we are going to uh, look into and see if we can uh, uh, get it get it done. But we've had we've had discussions around uh, such a solution before. But like I said, it, because it's not. Uh, the, the, one of our major deliverables we, we probably might take a bit of time to to have such a solution in place yeah sorry before we transition to the next question i think it's an important question here with, with the countrywide rollout are, are there discussions in the ministry to to try and implement this because i think it will probably be an important part of smart care I mean, with plans to actually roll it out across it's a it's a bit weird that uh, i would have this care card but there's no way of of, of actually getting access to my own record, right? Which is a bit strange here. Do, do you know of anything currently going on in the ministry aside from CIDAS? Um, no, I do not. But the closest thing I, I have heard of is uh, there's a new private hospital, or not a new, but a new software which was released uh, at a private hospital. I think it was it's Fairview. So apparently, um, one of the features of, of that uh, EHR that deployed there is that a patient can have access, can be able to reschedule their appointments. That's the, that's the closest thing that we have right now. But uh, like I said, at the ministry level, we haven't had those discussions. We've had internal discussions around how we can uh, implement such a system, uh, but it's not, it hasn't yet uh, taken off. And I agree with you that it's something very, um, useful to a patient and we definitely need to get it done yeah i actually feel stupid that we, we didn't think of um, inviting someone from smart zambia institute it would have been nice and i'm sure they're better place to actually answer some of these questions but there's uh, a question from uh <clears throat> from tuesday while in the chat um, mr wally is a colleague in the in the department of library information science I, I don't know if you the microphone is working uh or you want me to read out the questions in the chat but there are two technical questions saying why my SQL, uh, why sorry, why Microsoft SQL uh, not an open source database system? I think at some point in your slides you you mentioned that you make use of I know there's PostgreSQL there, but you you mentioned that you also use uh, Microsoft SQL. Is there a reason why as opposed to just using? You know, yes. Uh, open source so 
Um, if uh, if you recall the time I showed that slide, uh, the SQL Server was under SmartCare, and the and the Postgres SQL was under uh, DHIS2 or FIMS. Um, so again, the reason we use uh, SQL Server in, in, in that context is that um, the developers of SmartCare um, decided to use uh, SQL Server as a backend for SmartCare. So we're sort of locked in to using SQL Server for the SmartCare backend, right? I agree with you that uh, the backend should probably be something open source, and uh, I'm sure that in the next, or rather, in the modernized or redesigned version of SmartCare, they they made that consideration. So it's not really our choice as siders, but it's we're making use of uh, what uh, the de the developers um, are using for the backend. Great, and then the other question from. Uh from Mr. Wally says, did you look at, uh, is it Open Clinic Health Records Management System before developing a new system? I think uh, saying, I think the question is linked to why smart care and not just um, sort of like make use of an open source platform. Um, and then, yeah, so I think it's the same question, yeah. All right, okay. Um, again, smart care is not a CIDAS product, so it's not a CIDAS innovation. Um, although uh, myself and others have worked on SmartCare as software developers, we, we did that before we joined Ciders, right? Just to provide some uh, con context. Um, so SmartCare was designed to be a custom application from the ground up. At the time, they didn't really look at utilizing existing platforms. Um, that's my understanding. Um, in terms of usage of other tools within Ciders, um, there are a couple of projects which have used Open Clinic, Open Clinica, and are still using Open Clinica. But uh, primarily, right now, we're trying to make sure that we use uh, DHIS2 for almost everything. Okay, so as it stands, probably for the last eighteen months or so, every new project that comes up, most likely will make use of DHIS2 unless. Otherwise, in, in a few instances, we make use of ODK, but for, I would say, 80 to 90% of the projects make use of uh, DHIS2. I can chime in on that. Yeah. All right, so maybe, sorry, so maybe to just chime in on uh, Jacob's re responses uh, regarding uh, why, why not open Clinica in the other records management tools. And I'm assuming that, uh, that's in reference to the use of smart care um, and probably also our choices for DHIS2. You won't find that many comprehensive electronic health records management systems out there that are free. Um, and Open Clinica, DHIS2, uh, they, they, they are massively lacking to be a tool that can be used not only at the national level, uh, but one that has the, uh, the the necessary minimum requirements to function as a clinical support tool. So maybe I, th I think Jacob may have touched on this, is that SmartCare provides you uh, with its shortcomings, of course, but it provides the clinician uh, pretty much uh, every single uh, um, ailment that you might have, you, they, you can. It helps with diagnosis and things like that. It's not necessary at a certain level where it it, it does um, uh, proper clinical diagnosis, but you can use it properly as a clinical uh, system for managing your personal health records. If you go to the clinic for malaria, you be able, the smart care will capture that. And if you are given chloroquine, SmartCare has that drug chloroquine. Uh, we, of course, we are predominantly supporting HIV services. If, a, if an HIV client goes to the clinic, you are tested. It has a module for testing, uh, the different methods in which you'd be tested. And when you're placed on treatment, all the different drugs that you may be given, uh, they will be there in, um, in the system. Open Clinica. DHIS2, uh, they may have intentions of being used as EHR systems, but to be able to uh, adapt them to do that, it would take so much work that 
it's probably best to actually develop yourself to use a really truly EHR system or develop your own EHR system. That's number one. The other question, on, the other point I wanted to speak to was, um, okay, I think that was that 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 was it. Yeah, I think that was it. Then okay, maybe that I could also speak on the the legacy nature of smart care. Um, Jacob did a good job describing that. Like, uh, smart care has been in existence since two thousand, right? And right now, of course, it's going through um, uh, an upgrade, and they are working on um, a newer version that uh, utilizes newer technology. Um, and uh, uh, of course, Zambia is completely different from 2000, where network was a big challenge. Now it's still a challenge, uh, but you can uh, at least expect that most clinics will have internet. So, and the choice of SQL Server, if you go back to 2000, uh, open source database systems were not so much at the same level as um, SQL Server then. And if you're going to develop a, a system that's going to be used nationally, uh, and you had the confidence in the security of your data, SQL Server was going to be the choice then. But of course, time has changed, and um, even the new versions that have been considered now are using uh, newer technologies and the like. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think there's a follow-up question from uh, uh, Tuesday Wally again. It's to do with, uh, I think it's tied to the, the platform itself. So his question is to do with the records management cycle. Uh, does the system actually mirror the records management cycle itself? Uh, and then also another follow-up question is what's the retention period for the records that you keep in smart care? Uh, now I've, I've worked with, uh, with Tuesday while you're in a number of projects. So in the process I've acquired some, uh, knowledge in records management. So I, I can understand where it's coming from about the records management cycle. I don't know if you can respond. All right, um, I'm not familiar with the records management cycle, uh, but what I can tell you is that um, the records that we collect or the patient level details that we collect uh, exist in, in, in these databases for as long as uh, the patient is coming to the facility and beyond, okay? And, and so there's no, we don't actually have any um, uh, guidelines that I'm aware of with regards to uh, disposing of patient records because we're not the custodians of these records. We do make use of them for reporting purposes and for program monitoring purposes, but the end, the custodian of these records is actually the Ministry of Health. So there would be, I think, if someone is familiar with the Ministry of Health um, a records disposition policy, that there would be a better place to respond to that. And then there was another question on... Um, what was it on um, on the retention? Okay, like I said, um, we keep this record. Well, when I say keep, I'm using that term very loosely. We don't keep records um, for CIDA's use necessarily. Necessarily, these records are kept at the facility level. We have a copy of the records, right? And so, um, should there come a time when uh, the program ends and we no longer have the mandate to to run the ARG program? Uh, we will we'll most likely be required to uh, uh, dispose of these records if we're told to do so, but we use them for program monitoring and we're not necessarily the custodians. Yeah. So, so I'm sitting here wondering so if, I have a if question. Certain, certain records should actually be, sorry, Chris, for just a second. If, if certain records can actually be disposed, right? Like I can understand why my results, high school results should be, I guess, purged. <laughs> A hundred years from now, because I won't be around, right? So it, there's no purpose in keeping them. But for health records, I'm, I'm sure at some point in the future, we might want to learn from these records. Right? So I'd be shocked, actually, if uh, the ministry has some sort of retention period associated with such important records. Uh, but Christopher has a question. Yeah, thanks, right. thanks Leighton. Uh, uh, thanks uh, uh, for the presentation. I think it's quite en enlightening. Um, I just wanted to find out, um, I'm thinking in your presentation and also answering some of these questions, you keep referring to having a copy and um, 
I think there's an inference there that the data is actually kept elsewhere. I uh, just wanted to find out in terms of um, um, where that is and also what 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 particular policies you are then following to 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 deal with that. There's an angle obviously that I'm using to say that because I think from the industry that I come from, uh, the issue of data and where it's stored has sort of like become a very topical issue, especially uh, data that is uh, uh, holding information about citizens. Um, the second question I wanted yeah. to find out was also on the security. Um, maybe just for you to talk a bit about how uh, you have secured this information, uh, because we've had a number of um, incidences um, where that, whereby now the hackers are targeting almost everything that is worth uh, publishing and um, using to, you know, to try and um, and, and extract or, or rather extort money from um, uh, these individuals. So I wanted you to comment a bit on that, on the issue of uh, uh, the security as well. And then thirdly, I wanted to find out, the Smart Zambia um, <coughs> have been talking about this, um, I don't know what they're calling the system that they want to roll out in hospitals. I just wanted to find out how then uh, you're collaborating in terms of the information you have on uh, this art uh, program with um, the information that then they'll be collecting about the patients across the country and whether you, you are at all collaborating or you, 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 you'll be forced to submit this information to them at some point. Thanks. All right, um, I'm not sure I'll be able to remember all the questions, but let me give it a go. Um, so with regards to having a copy of the data at the facility, okay, um, as an ART program under CIDERS, okay, we have been given um, permission, if I can use that word, to have access to these records uh, for program tracking. However, in as much as we have access to this uh, uh, data, and we do make a copy of it for our program tracking purposes, uh, we operate under some very strict guidelines, okay? Obviously, we have to make sure that this information does not end up in the wrong hands, okay? So there's uh, confidentiality issues to consider. We do not share this information with people who are not supposed to have access to this information, okay? It's actually illegal. Uh, it's an offense for me to, or anyone for that matter, to uh, share a database of ART patients, for example, okay? So I think as part of the uh, our responsibility as an organization, we understand the sensitivity of the nature of this data, and so we, we strive to make sure that this data does not end up in the wrong hands. From a technical perspective, um, all the data that we store in our, in our databases, either DHIS2 or SmartCare, all right, is, um, is secured. First of all, the systems are password protected. That's one layer of protection. Secondly, uh, in as much as we're transporting databases between facilities and our office uh, via uh, the internet and the like, uh, the data itself is encrypted, okay? So I would be very impressed if I found someone who was able to, uh, or someone was able to, to get a smart data, database, and it's not impossible, but I would be impressed if someone was able to do that, all right? And of course, uh, given time, anyone can, any hacker can crack anything, given enough time and motivation, right? But obviously, efforts have been made to make sure that this data is only accessible by, um, people who are authorized. And then another thing I should mention is that the way the data is stored is not in a way that you'd be able to easily understand. So even if I was a hacker and I had all the time in the world and I got a hold of the SmartCare uh, database and I looked at the data, I would need to know a lot about what's going on in the ART program and the data storage structures and the data storage mechanisms for me to understand that data, okay? So in short, while it's, while it, it's, of course it's possible to crack a system, it's possible to have access to data, but for you to get to a point where you have zero information about smart care to hacking it and getting access to it, it's, it's a, really a, a time consuming and labor intensive process, which, which probably you're not going to want to do, right? Secondly, the issue of location. What we do is that we make sure our, our smart care server is hosted here locally, 
yeah, within the building. We have our own private cloud, so it's hosted within the country. I think that's one of the provisions um, that the government has provided is that all identifying information about uh, Zambians should be uh, hosted within the geographical boundary of Zambia, and we we have met that um, uh, requirement. So, and this is one of the sticking points that we have with other with uh, some upcoming projects who perhaps would like to host data within a cloud that's hosted on the public internet. And so we always insist that we host our data about our patients within our geographical boundaries, if possible, within um, uh, CIDRs. Um, about the question of uh, whether we have collaborated with Smart Zambia on the development of the system that they mentioned, I think I touched on it uh, earlier. Um, I would say no, we have not, because uh, to me it sounds like a different uh, uh, direction from what uh, we have been involved in with our work with SmartCare, and so we haven't been involved in that, we haven't had any, any input in that, uh, but from our interactions with uh, colleagues in MOH who are responsible for e-health uh, in Zambia, their preference is that we or everyone who's coming into Zambia or any new innovations in Zambia should are around electronic health records should not be necessarily a duplication of, of, of existing systems, but it should just be something that complements the existing system. But anyway, within government, they have their own uh, priorities and processes that we're not aware of. And so they may have had some justification to start developing uh, this new system. But what we do know as CIDAS is that smart care is the way to go when it comes to electronic health records and all our efforts have been to make sure that they, we push smart care out there to their health facilities. I hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, yes, you have. Uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Um, I think just something to take away there is that, uh, uh, look, CIDAS is, so, you obviously so maybe, have a mandate. Maybe I can just uh, add, uh, add to uh, Jacob's questions, uh, to Jacob's responses. Uh, hello, I hope you can hear me. So, uh, first of all, the uh, Jacob has, in, in his response has touched uh, quite on a variety of uh, different things and sort of like also the different data elements. Uh, the, the project that Jacob was describing for the most part is um, uh, is, a, is is a program that is primarily being run to support government activities. So the government has all these activities. They have this uh, uh, set of processes that they they would like uh, to be uh, to be adhered to um, in the in the in the management of health uh, records. So. They decided that smart care is uh, the national um, is the national system that every clinic has to use, at least for government clinics. So, when we when we are in the clinics and we are in any way uh, conducting our works, and that those works are related to smart care, we are literally just trying to support uh, government efforts. Uh, and 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 in doing so, we. We don't necessarily introduce any systems. We don't. Let me not even say necessary. We don't introduce any systems. We we use the systems that uh, the government has uh, given a go ahead on, and th and that's the nature of smart care. So, and I know that uh, the current structure in government is that all IT departments in every ministry are attached to Smart Zambia. So, whatever we are doing with smart care. Uh, with the support of the, the ministry's IT or informatics team is something that's uh, being driven by Smart Zambia. I do not know how the how close how tightly coupled that uh, connection is. Uh, that's one part. Then the second part, um, the nature of copies that are there. I think Jacob also described the smart card. So when you go to the clinic, uh, the clinic has a smart care instance. Uh, you you have a card. When you leave the clinic uh, with a card, your records will be on the card, and then there will be a copy of uh, your records on the server at the clinic. Remember that the idea of smart care is to replace paper-based systems. So you are literally replacing the existing system of paper uh, with electronic systems. So your records will remain at the clinic, and at least that's the current architecture that. Uh, 
the, the smart care instance belongs to the clinic because those are the records of the clinic. And you, the patient, you are also going to have a copy of your records, similar to how in the olden days we would have books. So we'd go back with a book of our patient records. Uh, this time around, we go out back with a smart card. Um, and then because we need to build a lot of services, you need to do backups. And depending on the nature of uh, the interventions or the type of support you provide to clinics or to the government, uh, you may want to have copies of those data sets. But all those copies also are given to uh, MOH. So MOH is the primary owner of that data. So even though we would have it, we would be uh, temporal custodians of that data for MOH. Um, and our use for it will mostly be for programmatic activities. Um, will be for programmatic activities. And by programmatic activities is that there are processes in the clinic that happen. So we want to improve, say, like the, the example uh, Jacob gave earlier, where uh, we want to improve the retention of patients on treatment. Uh, instead of losing 25% of patients that start treatment, uh, you want to at least have all the patients stay on treatment. We try to see what are the characteristics of patients that we lose so that we can, have, we can um, devise strategies of ensuring that those types of patients stay on treatment. So we would use the data to at least understand um, patient characteristics to help improve service delivery. Uh, so that's on the copies of uh, patient records. And also that's a, sort of like um, just knowing that smart care is a system. Uh, it's an MOH system. Of course, it has different funders trying to improve it, but it's an MOH system. And uh, Smart Zambia, I think whatever initiatives they are doing, uh, and eventually if they implemented and say, okay, this is the system that you, we, we have to go by, that's the system that we would also have to implement. And then on the security of the system, um, at the moment, uh, because it's it's a thick client in many ways, it's uh, your access to it is limited to a clinic. So at the moment, at least before uh, the adoption of new technologies, uh, it helps that uh, in part it's, that's one one level of um, uh, security that's there. But uh, overall, um, just like all uh, patient uh, records everywhere, it's uh, the data is encrypted. Uh, access to it is password protected. Um, we don't even in the clinic when you go there, not everybody has access to the machines. Only the authorized patients have um, uh, have machines. Um, but of course, I think IT, um, MOH probably might, and Smart Zambia might be coming up with even more better ways of um, uh, protecting this, these systems uh, that are run in clinics. Um, yeah, but overall, if the, when the data is uh, us who are collecting it, uh, if it's any data that's separate to, to the data that's being collected uh, programmatically, and mostly that's for research data, we have to put in um, an application that clearly defines how the data will be protected, where it will be stored, and for for the duration of time that it will be kept before it's uh, destroyed. So that that's sort of like different from um, uh, the presentation that Jacob was giving. So I've, I hope I've just added more elements to what Jacob explained earlier. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you have. Uh, uh, thanks. I, so I just wanted to add to, uh, to that. I think, I think it's been well explained. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Yeah. So um, I was saying that thanks for the thanks for the responses. I just wanted to add to that. Uh, I'm probably just find out the security aspect. Um, so do you do is it how is the configuration like in terms of the the the, the structure and roles? Do do you have um, um, a cybersecurity team uh, within? CIDA that then looks at the vulnerabilities that um, of these systems and make recommendation patching these things up or do you have external firms that sort of like come once in a year to look at your vulnerabilities and then patch them up or how how is that how is that done that is what um, I was also referring to when I was talking about the the policies earlier because you you will note that for example some of these things that um, 
the government is trying to come up with, especially Zikta, there's a strong emphasis on the cyber security. There's a cyber security law which is being uh, crafted right now, uh, which will obviously look into some of those things. But just for uh, the organization in terms of policies and so on and so forth on cyber security, how do you get that comfort to say, uh, yes, smart care has been working for from 2000 and every year we do the vulnerability tests and uh, these are the results, these are we're patching up and this is the status now and so on and so forth. Um, okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, but I think it, the, it. the first part is that remember that uh, these systems are running in the clinics and uh, everything that's running in the clinic is owned by, um, by the government. Uh, we're just supporting those elements. However, we do have a tech team and an ICT team that also support that 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 provide this extra support to MOH to ensure that these uh, systems are well maintained and uh, that they are secure. Their their approach. So it, I need to I need to be very careful how I answer this question because one, there's the element that uh, that the very fact that these systems are being run in the facilities and their identity or their ownership is not that of the organization, but that of the government. And the government has that responsibility of ensuring that they're well maintained. Is that part? And is the part where uh, we are supporting the government and, and trying to make sure that uh, systems are secure, data is backed up, it's never lost and things like that. So in some facilities, we have um, tried to secure some of the system uh, following our internal ICT um, systems. However, there's just a, the, the, it, uh, we cannot uh, em employ our systems entirely on clinic systems because that's not within our mandate. So uh, I wouldn't say that we, we take that lead role in the in the in the in the in in, in sort of like providing this 360 uh, security of the data, so sort of like that's the, sort of like the responsibility for MOH. But I'm assuming that they may have ways and systems that they have that they do to protect the data and ensure that uh, it's secure and they are running all those uh, um, uh, checks that have or guidelines that have been put up. But I must say that. Uh, Maybe even from our end, that's sort of like something that we should take back home and and see what Zikta recommends and how best we can support MOH to ensure that those things are also happening in the clinics. So that's that's a very very good point. I think that was one part of the question. I think there was another part of the question that I can't quite, quite, quite remember. What's the other part of the question? Checks and variability and feedback. I, what what was the other part of the question? Um, th thanks, Master. So now you're making me forget the question as well. But I think you've, you've, uh, <laughs> you've oh, yeah. tried okay, to, to, to. Okay, so maybe it. the yeah. major, major point to say here is that um, our our role is to support government efforts in everything that uh, around um, the, the the area in which we are funded in, like uh, uh, management of data management systems and things like that. Uh, but the overall responsibility lies with the government to ensure that everything is running accordingly. And also that our we are also adhering to um, to government's um, requirements or guidelines uh, in these management of systems. But really, they belong to the government. The moment we uh, so if we provide computers, we provide staff to help with data entry, and so everything that we provide is just to ensure that the uh, continuity of care within the clinic or provision of services within the clinic in the areas where we've been funded uh, continue, is done smoothly. But there are certain aspects that we do not have jury, jury dis, what's the way, jurisdiction uh, to make sure that it's being done properly. It will be sort of like in a way outside uh, our scope of work. Yeah. So, but so once it comes to once it comes to the, once we, that data is managed by us, that's sort of also a different story. Yeah. 
So I was, going, I was going to add to say my fear in all of this. I mean, you, you touched on a number of things here. I mean, for instance, I mean, disturbing remarks like uh, you fund people so that they capture data on behalf of government right now. If there's no money to pay data entry personnel, where is the money going to come from to hire security experts to, to actually make sure that these records are safe? Right? And, and also, right, if you think about it here, if, if, it was the, if it was the financial sector, maybe people would take this more seriously. My other fear here is that we haven't got into a stage where we value these sort of things, like uh, health records, right? So, um, obviously- Okay, so maybe light on a quick question, uh, a quick response to your point. A quick response to your point. I think uh, also we, one of the things we should be mindful of is the, um, is the, uh, our current um, environment, like, where are we at techni technologically uh, to date? Um, how long have we been using these systems? Um, and within the time that we've been using these systems, how much have we matured that we are aware of all the different corner cases uh, of these systems? Um, the beauty about it, of course, we are learning from the West who probably have more advanced systems and have been using this for years and years and years. Um, because even the systems that we are talking about here, uh, their scale up uh, has probably been in the last year or so. Uh, so, of course, we don't want to be caught unaware when there's a huge uh, data breach, uh, data breach, but we should just sort of like contextualize sort of like where are we coming from, how are we advancing, uh, what level of maturity are we at, uh, and what are we still behind on? Like we mentioned earlier, the current version of smart care is literally using technology from 2000. We are talking of 20 years ago, right? Uh, from 2000, uh, it's it's a thick client uh, offline system, doesn't work uh, over the internet, uh, completely cut off. Uh, so the type of challenges that you have in that scenario is people stealing the machine. Okay, so there's no internet. Okay, if there's internet connected to those computers, it goes through a VPN, and uh, I mean, it's sort of it's pretty much offline. So when you take that into account, and then think about okay, where are we going? We talk we talked about uh, smart care being upgraded, being made more web based, and things like that. So the security challenges increase, and the risks sort of increase, and you start thinking of okay, uh, we need to hire IT exp uh, security experts here. Uh, because the risk has sort of just exponentially increased from the from an offline system to an online system. Uh, you, you get my point. So sort of those are some of the, the the other things to think about as we say, okay, what support, what do we need in the uh, uh, currently to ensure that the data is secure and stuff like that. Yeah, I hope I've not mumbled too much, but. Uh, Sort of like that's the thinking that we, we, we might have when we're thinking about what types of systems do we have here and uh, what types of security do they need. Is it a, is it a web-based system that it needs somebody to com continuously monitor it and ensure that all different types of checks are done? Or is it an offline system that if somebody steals the data, database backup, they can be able to unwrap it and view it, you know? Those things are the computers in an offline system properly secured. Secured are the hard drives encrypted? So sort of like those basics. Um, yeah, sort of like my contribution or my response to that question. Thank you so much. Uh, just just to mention for those of you that did not attend the May fifth talk. So the issue of uh, data you know, security came up with Miriam's talk, and so Miriam's talk was centered around the telco sector. And it turns out her response was that. Um, you can't come up with uh, a, a solution that is completely foolproof. For starters, I mean, people like Mishash and Jacob have access to those uh, to those records, right? They have root access, I'd like to think. Uh, some one so of them could say, just say, decide to link, could just decide to say link what? the record. I'm the saying, data records? Yeah, I'm saying this whole notion of data security, you know, there's no solution that is 100% um, foolproof, right? Yes. There's always That's going to be... I was just trying to latch on to previous talks to say the issue of uh, data security came up when uh, Minimo gave a talk in the telecom sector. And I would like to think it's going to come up again when Christopher gives his talk. Uh, he works in the banking sector. So 
this issue is there. I don't think you can fix it. Uh, there will always be like loopholes that people will take advantage of. I mean, you have similar cases at UNSA where records are altered, right? So anyways, I think there's a question from Knox. Hello? Can you get me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Doc. Um, I, anyway, I brought up so many questions, but I think I'll just ask to, yeah, in the interest of time, uh, to start with, um, with the introduction of um, National Health Insurance Scheme by the Republic, of, by the government of Zambia, um, are there plans to integrate the two uh, platforms or systems, uh, the smart care and the NHIS such that if, if I'm to visit, let's say, a health facility like UTH, I shouldn't carry two cards, two separate cards, one to identify me if, if I'm a member on the National Health, health Insurance Scheme, and also if um, my records should be available on the smart care system. And then the other question I had was um, with regards to being able to, to, to have capability for health information exchange. Let's say, for example, if someone goes abroad, uh, maybe to seek medical attention in South Africa, can this card be used elsewhere such that their uh, electronic health records are up to date and then when they come back to Zambia, uh, there should be a history uh, tracked in terms of where they got treatment and what kind of medications they, they were given. Okay. Um, all right. So your first uh, question was around the integration between smart care and uh, the national health national health insurance um, uh, program. Uh, the answer is I wouldn't be aware uh, if there was such an innovation because, again, uh, that's not within our mandate as to, to work on those things. But I am certain that um, that will likely uh, be done in the near future if, if it's not already been worked on. But I can't say for certain uh, yes or no whether it's been done. Uh, for the second question, um, so the thing is that uh, different electronic health record systems have different uh, data structures and they have different uh, platforms on which they run. And so it's not possible right now for, for me to get, uh, for anyone rather to get a care card from SmartCare and uh, try to uh, read it in a different electronic health record system because the technologies will not speak to each other. Even if uh, the data is stored in a similar fashion, but because the design of the they are not designed to speak to each other at that level, then they're not going to speak to each other. However, um, it's possible to have a, a, a sort of a high level integration where data can be exported from, um, from, from smart care or, or another EHR and merge into another EHR in a specified format, but it should, I don't think it can be done right now in, uh, uh, at the level of the care card. So the integration does not exist at the level of the care card. Uh, but at a high level, it probably can be done. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, yes, but other, uh, otherwise, I think it would be nice if um, the cards would be able to, to be read uh, by other uh, systems elsewhere. You know, think, it, think of it like, uh, like your visa card. Let's say you go somewhere, you want to swipe. I think I was just trying to think in those lines. You should be able to... It would be nice if, if, if that could be happening, so, such that if I get um, treatment elsewhere, my health record is kept on track. Even when I come back to Zambia, you know, there should be that track record kept to say, uh, on such a day I traveled for this uh, medical attention and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um. Uh, hi, so that's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, unlike uh, visa cards and the like, there isn't a universal um, EHR system around uh, where you can plug and play across the world. There, there is a, um, 
but once that is there, it will be possible to have such systems implemented. There are existing standards of um, uh, record storage for health um, uh, uh, records. At least we have the basic, the, the standard is there. It's called, uh, you, you can find them online. There's a standard for uh, saving patient records for different diseases or different ailments. However, there isn't a universally recognized system uh, that you could use to read or piggyback or read other patients' um, medical records. And I must say that uh, that also is in part uh, due to the very, to the fragmentation of systems across the world. We are not aware of a single place in the world or a single country in the world where even the entire country uses uh, the same system. Uh, so even in the U, I, I don't know, even in the U.S., I think that's, this is the case. You can go to one clinic today, uh, be diagnosed with a disease. You go to, the, to another clinic that uses a completely different system. They won't have your medical history. So that's sort of like one of the challenges in the, in the health sector at the moment. But of course, there are efforts to have um, national and international systems that where your records can also be transferable across systems. Interoperability is a big way that everybody tries to talk about, but unfortunately, there isn't uh, a system to employ those um, at the moment. But yeah, it would be really nice to have that. Okay, okay. all right, thanks. So in the interest of time, I think we'll just take one last question by Jacqueline in the chat, uh, looking at the time here. It says, uh, so what security protocols exist for offline systems, seeing as the information can still be compromised at facility level? Um, um, what do you mean by information can still be compromised at facility level? I don't know if Jacqueline can respond to that, but, but I think she's, she was trying to, to speak to one of the points you, you raised to say, um, uh, is it there's a possibility of, well, ownership of data is at the facility itself. So is there a guarantee that, uh, are there mechanisms in place to avoid like data from being accessed to something at facility level? Let's say the, the Western province example, what, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that uh, the data is secured, right? Or maybe the Western province example is a bad one because you mentioned that uh, that's one of the places where you don't have personnel to capture the data, but do, do you have mechanisms in place at facility level to protect the data, I suppose? I, I don't know, I'm just reaching here. I don't know if that's what Jackson meant. Yeah, so, yeah, so there are two parts to the response I'm going to give. There's the the electronic protection of the data within uh, smart care, uh, which is quite uh, sufficient, and that exists at all the facilities. And so, and then there's the physical protection of the patient files, okay? And so the implementation of that uh, varies from one facility to another, okay? Um, I would say that um, it's, it's not foolproof, I mean, you can walk into a facility right now, and if you're friends with uh, a nurse, you can probably find a way of uh, accessing a register or accessing a patient file. That's quite possible, okay? I've visited enough facilities. Sorry, yeah, I just, I've visited enough facilities to know that this, uh, because so much of this information is still on paper records, uh, I can walk into my facility anywhere and just show my side as badge. And if I was a malicious person, I would get a patient file, take a picture of it, and post it on Facebook and say, hey, this person is HIV positive, okay? So it's not perfect. And we have a long way to go to have very strong security protocols around the uh, protection of patient information at facility level. Yeah. So it's a work in progress, in short. All right, so before we thank uh, the guys from Tidus, I, I have uh, a couple, just two questions, I think. Uh, simple questions, I suppose. Um, you mentioned that, I was surprised when you mentioned that the data is actually stored in Zambia, right? Now, I don't mean to believe to Zambia here, but I'm surprised you said it's stored in the cloud. Where exactly is this? Zambia National Data Center? Yeah, that's the first question. Uh, and then my last question is centered around data quality. I thought it was interesting when you use the use case from Western province where you have uh, 
Is it a data associate visit that facility once every month? How do you guarantee the quality of data, right? How do you, you make sure that you compile and you verify and you make records, but how, how do you, what sort of mechanism do you have in place to ensure that the data is accurate? How do you fix the issue of missing data records? All right. Okay, um, so for, uh, for the storage of the data locally, we have um, a copy of, I, I keep saying the word copy, um, because the custodians of this data is Ministry of Health. So Ministry of Health has the national smart care database at uh, their servers, okay? Um, so going forward with the introduction of the Zambia National Data Center, uh, the guidance is that uh, all government systems should be hosted by Zambia National Data Center. And uh, I'm certain that in the next uh, iteration of smart care, uh, the central database will be hosted by Zambia National Data Center, okay? Um, however, as CIDAS, because we have an interest in the program and we have permission to have access to this data, we do have uh, our own uh, smart care server uh, within our private cloud here at CIDAS. So as CIDAS, we have a cloud infrastructure that we have in place. Uh, it's quite adequate for most of what we need to do. And it is uh, assured that it is very secure and safe. Um, so far, we've not had any compromise of our, our, our systems. Um, the second part of your question was on data. Sorry to cut you short before I lose my train of thought. You know, my worry yeah. is, uh, I don't know how much of uh, the commercial building people remember. Back in 2011, that thing was gutted yeah, I remember down, that. Right? Data loss. Yeah. And so if you're saying this data is stored locally here, what guarantee do we have? Now, it's the same with UNSA. I was shocked when I was told by someone from GICT that uh, the backup facilities are somewhere around VET. And I'm like, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, are we, are we really that stupid, right? But so I, I don't know if um, if there are any you know any other mechanisms in place here. Yeah. So apart from the main data center we have within the building, we also have a disaster recovery site uh, somewhere in Lusaka, where the there are, we copy basically the entire cloud infrastructure data over to that disaster recovery site. So the probability of having two. Uh, catastrophic data loss events at both our main building and the, and our disaster recovery site is quite slim. And so we're comfortable in that we'll survive uh, such a such an event, should it occur. And then uh, to respond to your question about the data quality assurance for our data associates. So our data associates are trained, first of all, in data collection. Um, they are also given data collection SOPs before they go for data collection. So we make sure that we repeat and we preach and we give them enough documentation that they don't have excuses for collecting poor quality data. However, human beings being human beings do make mistakes. And that's how come we have that verification process that I referred to. So our verification is the final uh, step in our quality assurance processes to make sure that even if a data associate makes a mistake, uh, we're able to catch uh, those mistakes and we're able to correct the data before we to submit it for final reporting. So I asked that because I wanted to find out if you have some clever okay, ways so, of verifying So maybe just an addition to that. If it's a manual uh, Lighton, just a quick. So just an addition to that. When data is reported, right, we have very, uh, maybe this is also something, it's a process uh, activity. Uh, there are what, are what we do, data audits, very routine data audits. At every time data is reported, we still have staff that go back to uh, verify the data and uh, identify the gaps that may have caused the differences, if there are any differences. So that um, uh, also, in the long run, helps ensure that we are maintaining uh, very good quality. Uh, we, are, we are reporting data as accurate and complete uh, as it can be. All right, I, I thought that was a really nice session. It, it helped uh, complement what Paul, um, Paul spoke about last week. Uh, so thank you so much to the speakers and more importantly to the people that uh, stuck around until the end. I see we have 14 now, we had 25 at some point, close to 30, but we now have 14, that's good. But just to remind you in case you're interested that uh, next week we have uh, a, a more academic inclined talk by uh, Friday. Uh, so if you're interested in um, 
in a, uh, is it, I don't know if I can say computer vision or image classification, you might be interested in his talk. Uh, he uh, developed some prototype platform that is meant to automatically detect number plates and whatnot. So uh, I think that's going to be really interesting. Um, but thank you so much to the speakers. And uh, yeah, we look forward to having you come through to give talks in the future, actually. We are thinking of making it a tradition to invite ciders because uh, a perfect use case of uh, some of the wonderful things that are being done there. So thank you again. Uh, all right, uh, we'll see you next week if you are going to have time to join us. Thank you. The CSC 1541 right. students can stick around. We have a chat too. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Sure.